Good afternoon, everyone. We are live on Facebook. Today we have a very, very important uh, panel and very important things to discuss and to talk about. History, race, and law enforcement in America. Shanae, take the, take the platform and please introduce our guests. Okay, thank you, Ru. Um, hello everyone, I'm Shanae Williams. I'm the council member for the first council district in Yonkers. And um, I decided to partner with uh, Yonkers Voice and the Yonkers Family YMCA to host a very important conversation surrounding race and law enforcement and the history. Um, you know, in recent weeks, a lot of different um, communities have been rallying and marching for black lives and Stemming from that, we see a lot of people wanting to fight for social justice and to speak out about the, the systems that are built on race in America. And, you know, it's really important that we start having these conversations as uncomfortable as they may be for some of us. It's necessary. And this is going to be one of those conversations where it might be uncomfortable for some of us, but certainly necessary. It's a, an opportunity for us to learn as a community, an opportunity for us to grow as a community, and an opportunity for us to heal as a community. And it starts with conversations like this. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, first our my um, moderator, uh, Ms. Lucrea Ortiz. Uh, wrong slide, I apologize. Uh, give me one. Okay, Lucrea Ortiz is the president and CEO of the Yonkers Family YMCA. She has been with the Y in various leadership roles for seven years. She's an attorney by trade and former public defender and law clerk. Lucrea has been steeped in the work of equity and social justice for the marginalized all her career. It is the lens that she leads with. And so I'm really honored to have her here moderating this important conversation for us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our panelists today. We have with us Dr. Sophine Charles. Uh, Dr. Charles has dedicated her professional life to empowering youth, parents, and families. She has been instrumental in, in helping incarcerated citizens transition back into communities and supporting the professional and leadership development of police personnel. She is the Director of Preventive Services, Policy and Practice at the Council for Family and Child Caring Agencies, where she advocates for the policy and practice needs of more than 100 nonprofit agencies delivering services to children in foster care, juvenile justice, sexually exploited youth, and families that are involved, as well as um, just all aspects of the child welfare system. Uh, Dr. Charles is a retired New York City police officer. Congratulations to you. Um, and she currently serves as an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where she teaches in the police executive leadership programs. She's a member of the New York City chapter of the National Organization of Blacks in Law Enforcement, and she's the chair of their National Education and Training Committee. Dr. Charles has a bachelor's degree from York College, a master's degree from New York um, and New York Institute of Technology and a PhD in Counseling Psychology at Fordham University. Welcome, Dr. Charles. Look forward to hearing everything that you have to teach us today about history and law enforcement. Uh, our next panelist that I'd like to introduce is Mr. Damon Jones. Uh, many of you know him because of Black Westchester Magazine, uh, but he's so much more. He's an activist, he's an author, he's a radio host and publisher. Mr. Jones is a 30-year veteran of the Westchester County Department of Corrections. He served 13 years as a union delegate for the Westchester County Corrections Officers Benevolent Association, and he has uh, four years under his belt as president of the Northeast Region's National Black Police Association. Uh, Damon is currently the New York State Representative of Blacks in Law Enforcement of America. And he has a long list of boards and organizations that he's affiliated with. But I think for the purpose of this forum, um, two of them I'd like to mention that he served on were the Mount Vernon City Council's Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is an, it, it is an independent oversight board for Mount Vernon Police Department. Um, and I'd also like to mention that he did serve on County Executive Latimer's transition team on their criminal justice subcommittee. 
So we certainly know that he's experienced and we look forward to hearing everything that he has to share with us today. Um, moving along to Saidana Brandon Douglas. Saidana is a 23 year old digital content creator, entrepreneur and social justice activist. She uh, received her bachelor's degree in technology systems management from Stony Brook University, yay SUNY schools, um, in 2019. And she actually just received her master's degree from the same program this past May. So congratulations, grad. <laughs> um, she serves as as the vice president of the College Democrats group of, on her campus, advocating for student involvement in the political process and bridging the gap of accessibility between students and elected officials. She started her business, SBD Digital Media, in her junior year of college. What an accomplishment. Uh, Saidana uh, has been a lifelong resident of Yonkers and she grew up around Westchester community activism and politics. She's a member of Sister to Sister International Incorporated and a past president of their STEAM Academy for Black girls and girls of color. She aims to continue to serve her community by advocating for social and economic justice, youth empowerment, and entrepreneurship. Thank you for being here, Sayadana. It is really wonderful to have a young person that is driven in the community share their perspective on, on policing in America. Uh, and finally, but certainly not least, um, we have with us Detective Sergeant Charles Walker, who is a who is the president of the Yonkers Guardian Association. He's a member of the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, and he's a detective sergeant in the Yonkers Police Department. Truly, he's just an overall brilliant mind who I am excited to have on this forum today. So thank you for being here, uh, Detective Sergeant Walker. And now I guess I will turn it over to our moderator, Lucrea. Thank you, council member. Thank you so much for arranging all of this and for Yonkers Voice hosting us. Um, hello to our audience out there. Um, I wanted to talk to you first. Um, and let you know that we are uh, creating a conversation of construction um, and good dialogue that will be fostered by respect. So uh, your commentary and questions should be centered in that. Um, and also, uh, we understand that the, the uh, race is a continuum in terms of learning and everyone's at a different point on that continuum. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, and then the other thing that's very important right now in our nation's conversation in race um, is that we center black voices, black thought leadership and stories. We are in a moment in our history when those stories need to be front and center. Um, so it's really important that all of us um, as American center, uh, citizens keep centering those stories. So I'm going to start us off with um, providing a baseline, because I think it's important to enter any conversation with a baseline of definitions. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Charles, if you can unmute. and. Um, I would love to hear from you for the folks that aren't familiar. There have been all these terms being tossed around for, for people that may not be familiar, like systemic racism and implicit bias. Can you uh, define systemic racism for us? I will absolutely give it a shot. And let me just say um, uh, happy Independence Day for those celebrating Juneteenth Day. It's incredibly important to acknowledge the context, the historical context where we find ourselves and also on this panel. Systemic racism is defined, as you know, very broadly and different depending on the person who's giving the response. In very basic terms, systemic racism is white people having an advantage over black people across all institutions in a society. And a more academic uh, response to that, systemic racism is a social arrangement where white people benefits in every institution 
across all arrangements of the society and black people are on the, the bottom and lack access and equal access across all institutions, political, social, educational, health, academic, all institutions. And Blacks are limited from accessing those institutions with any equity. And that's a very baseline definition. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that you said that there are varying definitions. So for those that are watching, you may read a different kind of definition, but I think gleaning um, generally from what Dr. Charles said is really important. So Damon, I'd love to turn to you now. Um, how would you define implicit bias? Im implicit bias will be bringing your norms and values um, to the workforce if we're dealing with policing um, your biasness we find that a lot of people have um, prejudgments of other ethnic groups um, they have misconceptions of what other ethnic groups their beliefs and customs and they bring that to the workforce and it does a detriment um, um, especially in, in, in an institution of policing, if, if you are, if you're biased in your actions and even in policies. Um, um, so we have to deal with um, policies and procedures that, pro that a lot of times because um, law enforcement was created um, in the enforcement of the slave codes and the black, in the black code. So they started off um, with implicit bias in, in how um, they were enforcing rules that oppress people of color. So, um, but mostly is is officers or management or people in in in, in institution that that bring false to me false narratives of how other ethnic groups are. Sure, sir. Sure. So we've been hearing those two terms a lot, Dr. Charles. I'd like you to explain how are they different and how are they connected. Right. Well, I, I would just like to add to the definition that Mr. Jones just offered, and we need to be really careful about the use of implicit bias, because we all have implicit exactly. bias. Yes. The difference right. is, is when you have implicit bias and you have the power to practice exactly. and enforce punitive measures to yes. limit or limit access, that's a very different thing. Implicit bias is a softening way of saying systemic or structural racism. racism. So you really Absolutely. wanna be careful with that. And in my experience, the use of the term and the, the definition of implicit bias is a softening of the reality for many white folks and we want to make sure that we, I have a bias against SUVs because they're big and they take up the road. But at the same time, I don't have the power to eliminate those vehicles from the, the highways. Um, and so just because I don't like something doesn't mean that I have the power to create some restrictions or limitations for other folks. And so that's why we need to be careful when we talk about implicit bias. We all have them, but people of color do not have power in this system to apply any restrictions based on their bias or yes. implicit bias. I love that, snaps for that. Because in the equity conversations that I've been having, you know, I've been saying to people who are in positions of power and can do training, to really think about doing uh, undoing racism training, systemic yes, racism training, because that implicit bias, again, softens it, right? So I think it's important to name what it is and do training that will undo what we're looking to. Um, Sergeant, or Detective Sergeant, I'd love to move to you 
and have you uh, comment on how you see uh, systemic racism playing out today in law enforcement? Well, uh, excuse me. Just as you guys pointed out, um, Dr. Charles did a great job with uh, talking about the power component involved with mm -hmm. that. That's what you see now. You have um, you have young men and women entering into the uh, law enforcement field uh, without even really hearing about implicit bias and what that means and how they take that into their uh, careers. Uh, we do a lot of uh, good with training in terms of, of, of techniques and, and, and you know, rest and law, but dealing with those early on before they enter into the actual field or the community, um, I, I would like to see us do more in that regard. Right, for sure. Um, can you provide like a concrete example of how implicit bias might influence an officer's behavior and their interactions with um, black men or women? Well, I mean, you could, absolutely. So you, in dealing with traffic stops, for instance, you know, how biases uh, may affect whether or not that person may get a, a, a summons or a citation or not. Um, when dealing with a victim, uh, a witness, or a suspect, you may see biases play out in how we treat victims sometimes. Um, those biases can lead to re-victimizing the victim um, when they're dealing with them in a particular way. Uh, you know, and, and, and just daily interactions, daily patrol. You know, when you, when you patrol a certain sector or a street, the interactions you may have, the looks you may have, the conversations you may have, the enforcing of minor uh, infractions, you know, may take a different turn when, when you have these biases. Right, right. I think that's useful. I'm going to shift us now. I think we've, you know, set the stage with some good definitions for people to sort of understand and some examples, but I really would like us to jump into history because really looking back allows us to really examine what's happening now. So, well, Christian, uh, do you, you know, as you know, we are live streaming this to, uh, to Facebook right. and there is a little delay and uh, we have an audience that are watching us and eager to ask some questions. Sure. And they cannot wait. So I have to ask this okay. question from Juan Pastrana and this question goes to Detective Sergeant Charles Walker. He says, you are in a great position. Please ask him how systematic racism was used against him. Are you saying me personally? It's, this question is for you personally. I'm as sorry. a man of color, as in a, in a position of sergeant detective, something that we don't see much in the department that you work for. So I guess this question is addressed to you personally. You want me to repeat the question? No, well, what I can deal with is, is on a broader base, when we talk about, particularly me and the Yonkers Police Department, we can talk about the hiring practices, that's one. Um, Yonkers has approximately 200,000 residents in the city. African-Americans, black residents make up 20% of the population, roughly 20%. In the Yonkers Police Department, we are less than 6%. The department consists of over 600 and approximately 10 uh, police officers. We're at about 37, 38. And speaking of systemic racism, that's been historical. So for instance, in the last 20 years, we have hired over 530 police officers, where only 36 have been African-American. When we went to a zoning system back in the late 80s, 1990s, when we were able to group people in zones with their scores and pick where it would have been an advantage for us to combat some of the other ills, maybe nepotism, but it worked against us because in the decade of the 90s, we only hired five black police officers. So I could talk about the hiring practices within the city in terms of systemic racism. We haven't done well enough as the phrase is normally used in the actors that the police should represent the community in which it serves. We haven't done a great job in building equity when it comes to that. Back at you, Lucrea. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Charles? I would just like to personalize the 
policing while black question. And there is actually such a thing as policing while black. And that means that black police officers are subjected to exactly the same practices that are uh, applied to our young communities of color, black men and women. And there's so many examples. I am working to get black police officers to tell their stories more often. Because when they begin to tell their stories, their personal stories, it will highlight and emphasize the need for reform when it comes to the structural uh, racial structures within police departments. So a few examples that I'll offer is, number one, the, in the hiring practice, for, sh for example, Blacks are often told that they have heart murmurs and all kinds of other medical situations that would prevent them from entering the department. Another example is if a Black officer comes forward to intervene or stop some practice of a white officer or a black officer that is unethical or in the, the realm of misconduct, that officer becomes the target and the problem, not the person engaged in the offensive or brutal or misconduct act. And black officers who intervene are purged from the system in so many ways. Uh, disciplinary actions, uh, many are even uh, injured or hurt. Friendly fire incidents where black officers are killed by white officers and many times from their own precincts. Black officers are stopped and when they present their police credentials, sometimes those credentials are grabbed and thrown across the street and there are actual fistfights. Um, one example in a New York City precinct, the entire precinct was transferred because of racial conflict within the precinct. And so those are just some examples, but people of color really need to be real about their experiences in law enforcement. We have situations where high ranking executive officers may have the title and the position, but they don't have the power or the authority that a subordinate, a white subordinate may have. And how is that possible? Because they've got the long reach of social capital that reaches into headquarters and can become the platform for canceling out or nullifying any um, practices from that executive officer of color. So that's, those are some examples of systemic racism within the department that officers of color face. I love that because you really paint the multi-layered complexity of this issue, right? Whether you're in the community or you're an officer um, yourself. So I think that's very useful um, for people to recognize. Um, and I just want to say, I know in the audience, there's likely folks who are not from Westchester, not from Yonkers, but this area is a microcosm of America. So what you're seeing happening here is happening in other places. Um, I also think it's uh, useful to uh, center the black officer story. So I would like to go back to in history, back in time, and I'm gonna go back to you, Dr. Charles, um, as our historian. Um, what was the first form of policing in America? And how did that evolve over time? So this is a very long discussion <laughs> and I'll be as brief as I can. So you wanna know about slave patrols and before I can really talk about them, you need to know what police are trained regarding the history of policing in this country. The model that is used to train police officers in police academies across the country, they start 
in the 1820s, 1829, with Sir Robert Peel. He's considered to be the father of modern policing. And he instituted some, uh, the nine principles that police officers should adhere to as a part of the professional police department. That's what officers are taught about. And that's since 1829, and much of it is in the Northeast and policing many of the European, European immigrants in the Northeast and, and New York City, et cetera. So that's the model that most officers use. However, that's 1829. We now know that back in, eight, in the 18, uh, 1690s, there were slave patrols. And my definition is that that's one of the first forms of community policing where white plantation owners, slave owners were able to create an organized form of policing uh, to monitor and control slaves and the movement. And so as we know that slaves resisted from the very first time they set foot on this continent, they resisted and the greed of many of the white plantation owners, they kept bringing more slaves to the point where slaves outnumbered the uh, Europeans and the, the white landowners. And so now slaves were a threat. So they organized slave patrols and they were loosely organized at first, but then in 1704, South Carolina actually enacted a law where every white citizen was now charged with stopping slaves, questioning them, searching their quarters. They had no movement without interference or interruption from any white citizen, women, men, anybody. And if whites did not adhere, they could be fined or in prison. So that's an example how whites are forced into controlling the black population. And that's, I think, a pretty good introduction to slave patrols and how whites are inculcated into that whole control process. Now, let me ask a question from Gail Baxter, a Yonkers resident. Question for the panel. Would tearing down the blue wall of silence be a critical step in reconciling the differences between community of color and police department? If so, please explain your, your position specifically. So why don't we pitch that question to Damon? That's a great um, yeah, yeah, that, that is a great question. I also want to want to add that um, I, I, black officers have never been silent. The problem is nobody's been listening. Um, I've been on the job for 30 years. I know people like Ron Hampton, Roger Abel, um, that, that was in law enforcement from the 70s. And, and they've been saying the same thing. The only thing that has made that, that has changed is something that we call the cell phone and people are now recording all the incidents that black officers used to say over the decades that was happening. Um, as, as law enforcement, we've sat with pastors and politicians and, and, and everybody, but they just was not listening. Either that, either that or they were on the payroll of the police unions. So when we're talking about um, breaking down the blue wall of silence, you have to destroy the culture of policing. You, 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 it's the culture you have to, I don't care what policies you have. I don't, I don't care what procedures you have. If you do not address this culture, look, when, when 57 officers or officers decide to resign from units because we're holding one officer that violated policy and procedure accountable and 50 or 60 decide to come out of the unit, there's something wrong with the culture. You have to destroy the culture of policing. 
And the only way you're going to start destroying the culture, you start firing these people, period. Like we, we, we're, playing, we're playing games with them and we always have been playing games with them with this blue wall of silence and all this other crazy stuff. You stop the blue wall of silence if you start taking pay, paychecks. I'm telling you, been in this game a long time. Start taking their paychecks. They work for the taxpayer. They work for the taxpayer. I got, I got these red seats because I got a check from the taxpayer, right? Because, because, I'm, because I'm in law enforcement. So if you start taking their checks and holding them accountable, when it comes to, you want to break the blue wall of silence, start negotiating measures in the collective bargaining agreements. Start negotiating how you could fire an officer in the collective bargaining agreements. And if they don't want to negotiate, they don't get a raise. Simple as that. Let's stop playing games. Enough is enough. Politicians have played games with these police unions long enough. Long enough. And you want to break the blue wall of silence, stop giving raises. And start giving raises to officers that hold other officers accountable. They'll start turning in their brothers and sisters officers if they got a bonus attached to it. Start doing that. We have to, we have to really start holding people accountable and stop playing games with these police unions. That's part of the problem. You get ended overnight. Thank you. Thank you. That was as real as it gets. And I think it's really important to name those issues head on. Um, the listening part is what I heard. And right now, this is a moment for uh, folks in positions of power to really just be listening to these stories. Because I love what Damon said about how black folks, black people in law enforcement have been telling these stories and then shifts in culture, right? So I want uh, to, to talk about um, culture and, and de-escalation. So we've seen countless videos nationwide of starkly different interactions with white people um, by officers than black people. How, I'm gonna go to uh, you, Detective Sergeant, how can we fix this in training, right? You talked about that implicit bias, but how can we fix that so that those interactions are one and the same and people don't end up losing their lives? Well, I think in, in to Damon's point, when we speak about the culture, even when people, even when police officers are wearing body cameras, um, being situationally aware and, and in more common interactions um, that may dictate certain behavior. But when faced with certain situations and with implicit bias and, 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 and blatant racism at times, sometimes that, that situational awareness, uh, uh, you know, doesn't do them justice and they forget. And then they perform and act based on what they're feeling on the inside. The racism actually comes out. So to, to Damon's point, I think when we deal with culture, you know, we deal with the culture, with, with the training, with being aware, um, I think that, that, that starts the process. But, but to Damon's point, again, with, when we talk about collective bargaining agreements, um, there should be uh, more meat inside to deal with uh, certain misconducts and acts in regards to these, uh, these biases. Yeah, what could what could that look like, right? In terms of me, what what does that actually look like? And I can open that up to Dr. Charles or even Damon. You know, when we're talking about collective bargaining agreements, right, um, and our police unions, what are the things that we could sit down and talk to union leadership about when it comes to this kind of training? I would like to make one comment regarding de-escalation. One of the things that police departments really need to reckon with is the economics of policing. We have to understand that police officers' salaries very often are connected to overtime. They make an arrest, they get overtime, and there's a term in policing, they refer to it as collars for dollars. And so, the collars for dollars syndrome can cause an officer 
to escalate a situation to the point where they will make an arrest, thereby working beyond their shift so that they will earn overtime for that arrest. Now, is that something that all police officers engage in? No, but we still need to reconcile that there are monies attached to arrests. There's also revenue for the cities and the municipalities attached to summonses. And you know we've seen that in Ferguson, um, Ferguson, Missouri. The black community was um, really generating revenue for the city. And that's where all of their, their funds came from to pay police officers salary. So we really need to reconcile the economics of policing as it relates and is connected to escalation. I'm glad you were able to draw that line. I think that's important for people to understand um, the things on the inside that sort of affect someone's behavior or the, the work that they're doing that will economically benefit them. Um, I think that's useful. So uh, we talked uh, a little bit about history and I just wanna circle back to that. Um, so we hear the question a lot about uh, from white folks not wanting to be responsible for our nation's tragic past, right? So how do we talk through that history and how it's moved, uh, how it influences us today? How do we hold today's white folks accountable for that history? David? I can jump in here. Yeah, go ahead. So a lot of um, times when we look at what the systems are that have been put in place from history, um, they the effects of them are still being felt very real today. So while um, white people may not have implemented some of these systems, they are still benefiting from them for generations. And by that same token, black people are still being oppressed and negatively affected by those systems. So until that is rectified, then there is a responsibility on their part in order to make that right and to rectify that. And so one way that I would say is um, very important to look at is reparations. So that needs to be advocated on for on a community level, on a city, on a, a county, state, national level for reparations because that was the treaty that was signed with Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and today's Juneteenth, right, that celebrates the official end of slavery. So within the Emancipation Proclamation, it was agreed upon that there were going to be reparations for what was done to African Americans in this country and the way that they have built this country, they built this country completely for free. So um, that still needs to be rectified and that equity and that economics is the, um, the foundation of a lot of the issues that we have today regarding race, especially given that we live in a capitalist society, that economics are extremely important and um, black people's lack of opportunity and access to that equity has shut them out of many positions of power and um, that ability. So that is really the forefront of where we can, what we can do in order to um, make that rectified. That's fantastic accounting of history and how it applies today. We really hope that white folks are listening, right? What I heard from Sayadana is that word benefit, right? That history allows you to benefit. So I think listening, learning history is really important. I'm going to stay with you, Sayadana. Um, there's a lot of tension, right, between people uh, between police and the people they serve in communities right now, um, here and everywhere. Um, what are some good ways to bridge the gap between community and law enforcement? And I think it would be useful to provide your lens as someone who's grown up in Yonkers. 
Definitely, yeah. So I'm a lifelong um, resident of Yonkers. And when we look at um, what has sparked a lot of this change that we have seen recently, when especially zeroing in on systemic change, um, it came from those like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and so many more who their names did not even make it to the national stage. And so they should not have had to die in order for us to be making these changes now. But I think especially for um, within my generation, we are grateful for those that came before us that showed us the way of fighting for civil rights and we're ready to take up the mantle. A lot of the activism that we have seen within um, the Black Lives Matter movement being reignited has been with young people. And so um, when we look at the community um, and in terms of the relationship with policing, I have had members of my family who have have served as Yon on the Yonkers Police Department for generations. And so um, they have served with honor and with um, pride, and they have been pillars of examples of how you protect and serve your community. And so again, when we're looking at that systemic versus individual, that they were, um, a, they are examples of individuals, but we need to make sure that those same core values are then transferred to the system. And whether that is in training or whether that is in um, reforms and legislation, all of those key areas to make sure that um, police are held accountable for their actions. So um, I think that those are key ways that we can start to bridge that gap. And also um, looking for ways to have responses that are unarmed. So having those who are trained and can come in and de-escalate a situation, but not every situation may need armed forces. So being able to um, have other systems in place that we can uh, refer to in times when we are trying to make this more of a, a, a community experience where the community really is being served. That's great. The voice of the youth is pushing us right now. So I appreciate your perspective. I think it's very important. Um, and we need your generation to push the envelope even more. Um, so we'll keep the conversation going. I talked a little bit about building bridges. One of the ways that we've seen police departments build bridges is um, co community policing models, right? Community policing programs. So um, do we have community policing programs here in Yonkers? Um, Detective Sergeant, and if you could just talk to me more about how that looks here in Yonkers, and then I'd love to hear from Damon about the rest of Westchester. Well, uh, we have recently expanded our community affairs division uh, to, to, be, to encompass more of the police community relationships. But what I would like to add is that, and I'm, I'm sure uh, others can attest to this, is that um, the greatest interaction with the police and community is done on patrol. And I think that's where it, it, it counts more. There are programs out there. Um, you know, we've had Coffee with a Cop, Stop and Shake, and other programs um, that have uh, done some good. But we used to have programs, we, had, we used to have more foot posts where police officers would have to walk through the community. We have parking walks where officers would have to park their cars and you know, uh, involve themselves with the community and getting to know them as well. Uh, I would like to see more of that in terms of community policing. I don't think we have enough one-on-one -on -one interactions uh, with the public. Uh, a lot of it is, is, is patrolling sectors and, 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 and radio cars. So you don't get that day-to-day -day interactions um, when people are in field training, uh, they learn, you know, tactics, they learn laws, they, they learn the areas, the streets, but I think we need to do better in learning the people as well. And I don't think we do enough of that yet. Um, you know, for instance, the Stop and Shake program. Programs like that could be easily implemented in the field training program before officers get out into the street and, and, and know the stakeholders within the community. So there's more, we can take a more proactive approach when it comes to community policing that I would like to see in Yonkers implemented. Absolutely. Damon, I'd love to hear your perspective on community policing. 
Um, yeah. I, um, first, what we see, I have a mentor. His name is um, Professor Jimmy Bell. He um, he was the head of um, the uh, criminology um, and the sociology department um, at Jackson State University. Um, a, a little unknown fact that he was the originator of community policing when it when it was first modeled in a in a town in Florida, but it was called extended community policing. And the reason why he called it extended community policing because you're looking at the systems in the city. How 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 do policing relate to the systems and institutions um, in the city? Um, basically, what what he was basing it on is um, African people, we are extended people, just like we have extended families, and, and we deal in that matter. Europeans are most mostly a primary um, a, a primary culture, um, a, a, a primary culture. So we have to look at education. We have to look at economics. We have to look at job training. We have to look at how, and, and now mental illness. You know, the whole talk now is saying that police should not be um, used to respond to people that have mental illness, right? If we had real community policing, we would have knew that from the beginning, right? We would have we would have knew that because that's an institution that policing should not be used for. So, so when we're talking about community policing, first number one, you can't have community policing if the police does not live in the community. That is the main goal of community policing, right? We must have residency. We must have the police be stakeholders in the community. Right now, policing, I know Yonkers, they have residency, you have to, but, but many police departments and, and, and organizations like the Fraternal Organization of Police push for police not to live in the communities that they serve. Police must be stakeholders in, 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 in the community also. So if, if we're going to have true community policing, number one, the police have to live in the city. They have to serve the city. Num num number two, they have to be stakeholders in the city. Number three, the community must have a say-so in how their community is policed. Not one Black community in the United States have any say-so in how their community is policed. They tell them how their community is going to be policed. So we have to change the mindset and we have to change the understanding of what community policing is. It ain't coffee with a cop, right? That's not it. That's a policing program. That's not community policing. That's a policing program. So for us to understand community policing is the community taking control of the policies, procedures, and even who they hire, having a say-so, having a part of it, and, and then also making sure that these cops are part of the community and living in the community. And I also, one thing I just want to, I just, want to just add on, um, it was mentioned about the collective bargaining and, and um, in the contract. One thing that should be in the, in, in the contract is called the duty to intercede, meaning that if another cop see his partner do wrong, violating policies and procedures and training, especially um, violating someone's rights, he has a right to arrest them. He, has a, he, he, he definitely has the right to arrest them. We have to put that. Also, another thing should be in the collective bargaining agreement is, is, is the mandate that these officers show up to a CCRB when they are in when they are requested to come testify in front of a civilian complaint review board that they have to do it. So these are the things that elected officials can put in the collective bargaining agreement to hold officers accountable. Yeah. Now let, let me just uh, add this statement here from uh, a member of our audience. Uh, a uh, police lieutenant by the name of Tadeus Gamore. This is what he says. I fully agree that there are a police culture that protects abusive and racist officers and the culture needs to be fully and universally acknowledged from the inside out. If a law enforcement does not admit that it has a racist culture problem, it eventually implodes from the weight of his own culpability in racial violence and abuse. Now, 
there is lots of things. You know, we can create laws, we can implement, implement laws, but what about the mindset? Okay, mm -hmm. some of them are not racist because, uh, or protected by the law. They are racist because they are racist. Okay, so how do you filter those off officers out? And does the police union has any, fo any fault in that from pr protecting racist cops some of them know who they are, but they are being protected by the, by the unions in police department. And I'm not specifically talking about any particular police department. I'm talking about in general terms. I, I'm, they, actually, I'm actually going to pitch that to Sayadana because that question essentially is about how you change a mindset, right? And I think it's important to hear from our younger generation because um, they are this is fun. So go ahead. Yeah, definitely. So I would say in terms of mindset that um, through, as the years continue and as the generations go, we do see mindset shift naturally. And so um, we can probably. Oh, you mute it. You mute it. There you oh, uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. So yes, um, when it comes to um, mindset shift, we can see that as the generations go, mindsets usually um, develop and change. And so we can probably say that um, my generation is one of the most progressive in thought leadership of generations. Um, and, you know, there's a lot also that gets passed down in the household. So you learn from um, your family and your parents, you learn from the environment that you're in, you learn from the school that you're in. And so I think that it's important for us um, when we're looking at how we want to treat this, that especially um, non-Black people, white people, that they can uh, address the systemic racism that's happening when they are teaching their children so that children don't grow up thinking, well, we all have access to the American dream. And it just seems as if the black community is just not uh, reaching to the same level of heights. And so that must just be the way that it is in society, that that just, just must be on them. To help them un help the next generation and help um, young people understand that there is a lot um, gener generationally that has happened that has put this in place that skews the opportunities that black people are able to have. So um, I would think in terms of when it comes to the police force that having the rules and the training in place will um, help to weed out the abilities to be able to do that. So as Damon said before, having consequences. So your mindset is your mindset, but there needs to be consequences is when you act on your mindset and it affects another person's ability to live because they were really talking about um, that sort of situation here where it's, it's, it's about preserving life. So um, I think that uh, that is where we have to, that those laws and training, extensive training and police reform, that those rules within the rule book changing those will hold people accountable. And if they, they don't comply, they cannot continue on the force. So those will, those will um, help shape the way that community policing and policing in general is done. Thank you, Saidana, that's excellent. Now, so, Lucrea, do you mind if I just do another follow-up? I apologize sure, for interrupting. Sure, that's okay, go ahead. This uh, one comes from Kojic Presley Memorial, and it's addressing the councilwoman for what she's doing. Thank you for, uh, for this panel and answering the questions and platform. My question is, what is next step after understanding what? I guess that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think the next step after really um, continuing these conversations, especially uh, bringing in white folks in these conversations, because it's good to have their perspective too. And quite honestly, I would have loved to have um, a, a, a more diverse panel. I really tried. I, re I did reach out to several white folks in, in law enforcement to be a part of this panel, but I think it's something that is so scary for people. Um, and it's something that is so uncomfortable that 
they're afraid of saying something wrong and then being labeled, right? And so that's a stigma that we have to do away with as well as, as a people. But I think um, we have to have them at the table when we have these uncomfortable conversations so that we can work through it together. And I think a big piece for the next steps after we've had these conversations with everyone at the table is to start coming up with the solutions. Back to what Sayadana was saying about reparations, right? We need to figure out what that looks like in real life, what we need from, uh, from, from the community, what we need from people in powerful positions. That's a word that has been going around a lot, power. It, it comes back to power and money. What does that mean? How do we get around that so that we can get, do away with the egos and the power um, uh, uh, fight and, and, and put money aside and actually look at people and treat people fairly and equitably, if that's a word. I think I might have made that word up, but so I, I, I think it's really important to think about that. And that would be the next step is to start figuring out what those solution, what we want as a people, what we want as a community in real life, in all of these systems, not just in law enforcement, not in, you know, in healthcare, in entertainment, in, in just entrepreneurship, in everything, because in every system we have these type of issues. And so we have to look at those and start changing them little by little. So thank you for that question. If I, if I can uh, just jump back in, and I think um, we've been hearing a lot uh, in terms of solution, the word defunding the police, right? That terminology, and that's been an active conversation. So uh, Dr. Charles, I'd love to hear from you how uh, you define what is meant by defunding law enforcement. So thank you for that. Um, I will speak to the issue of defunding, but I just want to ask everyone a question as it relates to community policing. How is it possible that when we hear about community policing, we're generally talking about how com communities of color are policed? We don't hear about community policing when it comes to policing wealthy white and white majority communities. We don't hear about it in that context. And so community policing is when the community has some power and can make some decisions around how they are policed. Community policing is when you have the ability to call up the precinct commander, you have him on speed dial, when you have a problem with something that's going on in the community. That's community policing. Community policing is when, as a young cop working on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, my partner and I respond to a wealthy 86th and 5th Avenue. It was a man, an elderly man deceased. We arrive at the front door and the doorman says, could you please use the service entrance? In wealthy white communities, police are considered servants. And we don't have that type of relationship when police are uh, policing black communities. And so when we turn that relationship right side up, where police understand that they are servants, they're providing a service and they're guardians and they have that relationship with communities of color, that's community policing. And regarding the, 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 um, when the accountability issue, you know, things change when we hold everyone responsible, whether it's our elected officials or the police departments, officers, when we hold them accountable this movement that we are experiencing now is a way that young people and people of color, they're holding all of these institutions accountable. And that's where the change is coming from. And when you ask, what, is, what do they mean by defunding policing? Some folks will grab that and say, oh, they wanna abolish the police and eliminate policing altogether. That is not what is meant by defunding policing. 
Defunding means rearranging, shifting, applying the budget, the public service budget in a way that there is a prevention aspect involved. Prevention meaning funding youth development, vocational training, jobs, mental health services, health services, making sure that the folks are not involved in sleeping on the streets. There's shifting of the budget into more social services. Taking the police out of schools, that is historically new way to fund police. Paying police to go into schools, we haven't had that. So the same way we created a budget to create a pot for police to get paid for policing in schools, we can remove that pot and apply it somewhere else in a way that there is a prevention aspect built into how those monies are shifted. Yeah, I love that you also mentioned how policing occurs in wealthy white communities. Because if you look at funding, and I learned this from a from the, the great congressional rep, who's my Puerto Rican sister, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her answer to this question was, we have a solution, right? Our suburbs, many of our suburbs have a lot of their funding built into education and all of those areas, health and all of those areas that will benefit the, the community and less into policing. But when we go into black and brown communities, it's it's flip-flopped, it's switched the other way. So uh, thank you for that articulation, I think it's important. Lucretia, let me just add here a statement from Kit Olson. Kit Olson is the president of the Yonkers PBA. Welcome, Kit. This is his, his statement. The Yonkers PBA has public, publicly advocated for the return of food post and community police, policing for over a decade. The Yonkers PBA has also spearheaded programs where Yonkers cops interact with the Yonkers youth, particularly kids of color. Those programs are done on a 100% voluntary basis. And he adds this to, uh, to the councilwoman, you did not invite this white guy. Well, he's obviously in the conversation because he's viewing, and I appreciate the fact that he is. Um, go ahead, Shanae, did you want to uh, speak to that? Uh, I just want to say, Keith, you're right. I did not extend the invitation to you, and I'll keep that in mind for the future one. But I, I do think it's important for folks to hear from, from, from their local um, police departments and as well as their, uh, their union leaders because it is important to understand perspective from everyone. So you're right, I did not invite you, but I did invite the commissioner and I did invite others, but it's okay for the next one, we'll come back to it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for comment. conversations definitely have to continue, but I wanted to uh, pitch that to Detective Sergeant in terms of um, what Keith raised. Um, I don't know if you wanna repeat that, Rue, in terms of like the programs that are happening, so you can sort of speak to that and then maybe we can analyze it from Damon's perspective in terms of shifting culture and community policing even, because it sounds like we have programs here that can go a lot deeper. So go ahead, Detective. Yeah, um, so- um, def to, Definitely, you want me to rephrase the question, Detective, or you no, got it? No, I, I got it. Uh, to Keith's point, absolutely. There have been, there've been a ton of programs. A lot of them I've been involved with over the years. Um, one being the, uh, YPI program, Youth Police Initiative, and a lot of the programs, which Keith and I have spoken about, which I'm for, um, kind of get the community. There's a perspective. There's a perspective. And what we do is we partner up with these programs. We, we start these programs. And the, the, whether it's the Yonkers Force or the YPI, these, these children, of, or these, these uh, young adults get to see a pers uh, police perspective how we do our jobs, uh, why we respond in certain situations. And we have that type of dialogue, um, which is good. 
Um, but what I would like to take is a more proactive approach where we're listening and we're taking the information we get from the community, from the youth that we're dealing with, and let that kind of shape, to Damon's point back when we talk about community policing, let that kind of shape how we interact. Um, more of a listening approach where, where we're listening, especially in this time, but even before this time, just take a more aggressive approach in listening and, and, and letting that kind of dictate the relationship and what they want to see from us. Um, so it's, a, it's more of a give and take. I think we do a good job in, in one field. Um, I would like to see a more proactive approach where we're listening more to, to the, excuse me, to the community. Yeah, and um, I also wanted to point out, I'm definitely going to pursue Dr. Charles because I yeah. want to hear about community policing, but I also want to point out something that Damon said that I think is instructive um, for our uh, police officers on the line to hear. He talked about cultural differences, right, between Africans and Europeans, right, and that definitely lives here. Um, and uh, in my work in the Y, we do a lot of cultural study and we call that individualist versus collectivist society, right? So America is very much an individualist society and that's very European driven, but a lot of our um, African American communities, immigrant communities are very much collectivist in how they see things, right? They do things in very different ways. And I think that that's important for officers to understand. But um, Dr. Charles, please, I'd love to hear you know, your um, perspective on community policing. I'd like to add some comments regarding policies and practice. So we can into introduce programs that are community policing based, coffee with a cop, basketball, midnight basketball with the police. We can have all of those programs. The issue is, do we continue to make nice with our, our young people and talk to them and listen? That's important. But what about the the application of policies and practice. We need to have police officers who are advocates, youth advocates as well. So if you know that the beat or the sector you cover, that there's a population of youth who are idle and there's an opportunity for you to advocate for them to get some jobs, some vocational training or even eliminate certain uh, situations where they get arrested. You know, in New York City, for example, the uh, <clears throat> stopping a youth on the way to school because he jumps the turnstile, going to school, they may not have a pass, but it is school hours and they jump the turnstile, the police will stop them and give them a summons most of the kids are not going to go home and tell mom and dad that they have a summons. So what does that mean? That summons now turns into an arrest warrant. And that youth may never hear anything about that summons or that warrant until he's now got a driver's license and he's driving a car. So he gets stopped seven, five years later, and he's now got an arrest because he's got a warrant. And so an example of dealing with a policy is why are we giving summonses to our school age kids when they're on their way to school? Why not shift some funding to make sure that these kids can ride the subways and buses without getting an arrest, without being arrested? So that's an example when we talk about police as advocates instead of using that punitive law enforcement arm when there's an opportunity to de-escalate, to warn, to warn, to train, or be an advocate for that youth. Instead of arresting that kid, go to the school and talk to the principal, you know, about, or school faculty about giving that kid a pass. You know, so that's one example where we need to shift away from using that law enforcement application for everything. The kids who were jaywalking 
and were arrested in, I don't know, where was it, Louisiana, somewhere? Why apply a law enforcement solution to that civil, uh, you know, disobedience when it comes to a jaywalking ordinance? Detective? If I could just touch on that and make it specific to Yonkers when we talk about advocates and stakeholders. Um, one of the things with Yonkers is that when a test comes up every four years, you just need to be a Yonkers resident it's three months prior to the test. So you can live outside of Yonkers your whole life and have no connection to Yonkers and then take the test if you live three months prior. Then you need to live in Yonkers up to the time of your probation, which is one year. So after one year is up, you can move out of Yonkers. So when we talk about stakeholders and people invested in the city and policy, maybe we need to look at that, extending the time you need to be a resident and maybe looking at moving out after the year. I think when you talk about stakeholders and advocates, people like you know Yonkers Guardians and people who have lived in Yonkers their entire lives and others as well in the police department, we find that they're more of the advocates that we're looking for in our community. So that needs to be addressed as well in terms of policy. So let's talk about more about that word policy. So what kind of policy making changes should we engage in um, to hold police officers more accountable for their actions? What should be in place if there aren't any laws? I'm gonna give that one to you, Damon. There you go. Yeah, um, first of all, part of the problem is, is the policies that are in place, management is not holding officers accountable to them. So let's, you know, I mean, there are, there are policies in place. I think in, um, if, if we want to if we want to look at Westchester, we we must examine all the 43 municipalities uh, and uh, where are their policies at. You know, usually in New York, in Westchester, I'm going to keep it with Westchester. They keep it around New York State minimum standards. Um, there, there's only one um, there's only one police department out of the 43 municipalities that have national accreditation through CALEA, that's Scarsdale Police Department. But according to Amnesty International in their 2015 report, um, not one police department in the United States have, have proper policies on an international level dealing with use of force or, 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 or deadly force. So I think we must examine um, our use of force policies. And when um, Detective Ridley, Christopher Ridley was killed um, by um, Westchester County Police, um, they, Westchester County did a use of force policy review. And um, they made a lot of recommendations, um, but the problem with that, with, with, with that, pat, with that report, um, Westchester County does not have the power to make the 43 municipalities even adhere to the to the recommendations. Um, then you have, let's move up, then you have Barack Obama's 21st century um, policing model. Um, another problem with that, which had great um, recommendations, but another problem with that, that they couldn't force police departments to, to actually um, use the recommendations and 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 what we got out of that with is coffee with a cop, more coffee with a cop program, and they're saying we're doing 21st century policing. Well, if any of the police management or police officers read, actually read the 21st century policing model, the first step in that was um, being legitimate and having a and having accountability, um, which um, police officers and police departments have failed. Um, to do. So, like I said earlier, if we're talking a, a accountability, we, we have to put measures in. And just like the collective bargaining agreement, um, a lot of police departments put um, the duty to intercede, right? Officers have, 
have their 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 duty to stop another officer violating policy and and procedure not watching the officer do it and then and then hope nobody knows about it no you have to stop it and if you and if you don't stop it and we found out you was there watching it and you didn't stop it your job is on the line too um i think a lot of times um we see that there are policies but there are lack of enforcement um, of the policies because we got the good old boy network, right? How let's let's look at the, the example with George Floyd. How is the officer that had his knee on George Floyd's neck a field training officer? How is he a field training officer when he had 16 complaints and four and four use of force complaints? And you're gonna put him out here to train Young cops have been on the job for three months. Part of the problem is management. Part of the problem is commissioners. Part of the problem is supervisors. And then ultimately part of the problem is the mayor because the mayor appoints the police commissioner. The police commissioner works at the will of the mayor. So if we continue to have problems in our police department, and then the mayor is refusing to change management and change how the police department runs, the people need to change the mayor. That's how you change policy. That's through, through the power of the vote and making sure that you have the right person in there. Don't, and, and not even because they're black, right? You, you stop, let's not even fool ourselves, you know, just because we're gonna put a person of color in there that, that, that is going to change. They have to be willing and able to hold officers accountable through policy. And if the policy is not there, they have to be capable to create these policies. The policies are out there. It's, it's, it's nothing new. The policies, there's other police departments that have moved forward in, in holding their officers accountable, putting safe, safeguard measures in all these policies so their officers do not cross the line. And if, we, and we, if we're really thinking about it, even Robert Peel in the Peeling in Principles, if they were actually doing that, we'll have a better police department. They're not even paying attention to Robert Peel because Robert Peel says that the police are, are workers for the citizenry. That's from Robert Peel. So, so, so we have to hold our elected officials accountable to hold these police managers accountable to policy. They're supposed to be the professionals. And if they're incapable of doing it, and which a lot of them are because there's not one police department, major police department in Westchester County that does not have incidents of police criminality, not brutality, police criminality. And we have yet to do anything. We scream about George Floyd, but we got Kenneth Chamberlain, DJ Henry, I could I could go on and on where we have in Westchester and we haven't fixed the problem. You know, we 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 marching and rallying for somebody a thousand miles away, but we ain't said anything when police on tape called Kenneth Chamberlain Sr. the N-word, police officers, and then shot him three times with bean bags, a taser, and then openly shot him, used deadly force. We should, been, we should have been out there marching then. So we have to address our police departments and address our issues. The policies are already there. We need accountability to the policies. And if there's a little gaps in there, we can fill them with, with, with up-to-date policies. But I think it's accountability by management and accountability by our elected officials. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, I appreciate that. We only have 15 minutes left, so I'm, I just want to pitch to you, Ruth, see if there's any questions from the audience. Comment. Yes, there is, there, there is not a question, but there is a statement from Karen Beltran, who was running for mayor uh, last time, last election. She says, if those in leadership don't prioritize the right things, then we are going nowhere. Anyone agrees or disagrees with this? I agree. Yes. Yes, I and I also think it's I important agree. for leadership to surround themselves with the uh, voices and leadership and thought that is similar to uh, the folks on this call. 
Um, I have my own personal board of directors and they give me all kinds of expertise. So all leaders should have varying thought that will influence decision making. So I'm gonna uh, ask everyone the same question um, to wrap this up. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've learned a great deal from all of you. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Sayadana. Um, what do you think is the next step? What must happen for people of color to feel safe in America? Well, I think that um, it's definitely a complex answer to that, but um, we have seen that through the reignition of the Black Lives Matter movement, we have seen that um, a lot of institutions and systems that have previously upheld racism are starting to take small steps um, in order to um, rectify that. And so I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that the people are out in the streets, we're on social media, and we're demanding it. And so um, that is really when we see change happen. So in terms of New York State, we've seen the governor um, pass a lot of uh, executive orders. And we've also seen Mayor Mike Spano, he just um, closed a program to bring the body cameras into the city. So we see that steps are being changed. And I think next we need legislation so um, in terms of what Damon was saying that there are policies in place now getting in those new policies in order to have to bridge the gap where it does not exist currently and um, also then looking at how we can reallocate those funds that are currently in the police department into other areas. And so um, as some of them, to echo some of them that were named before, it would be to have good quality public education in the, in the city, in the, um, in the county, in the state. And then also um, to have after school um, uh, programs where students can go after to be enriched, to have positive um, options and things that they can engage in. And then also setting up programs for people to be able to start businesses. So having black owned businesses more farther and wider within, again, the city, state and, and the county, because that means that the black, us black people are owning where we live. We're owning the communities where we are. And right now we do not see that at the level of nearly as much as it should be. So um, I think that those are areas where the f um, funds from the police department can be reallocated, again, for that prevention um, aspect of um, having positive, uh, a, a, a positive relationship within the community. Um, I think that also um, we need to look at opportunities for what would be called um, the clean, state, clean slate repungent legislation. Um, expungent re legislation, excuse me, so that when those who have served their time then can come out and re-enter in society without still having the baggage on them that then prevents them from being able to get good jobs, access to good education, and things of the like. So um, being able to then just create um, opportunities through legislation that will allow us to um, have a more positive community experience with police and then making sure that they are enforced and having these check-ins regularly. And the time to do that is now. We're seeing the momentum, let's not wait. It's imperative that it happens now. I love that. And obviously you have a very bright future. Um, your perspective is heard uh, and I think well taken. So many multi-layered systems approach you took, so I love that. Uh, Dr. Charles, uh, what are the next steps in law enforcement? How do you see it? Well, the one thing I can say is what happens to, what do we need to do to make black people feel safe? One thing that we know that's not going to make them feel safe, and that is removing Aunt Jemima from the box of pancake mix. That's not going to make black people feel safe. And those are the kinds of things that are so, they think it's symbolic and meaningful. And maybe at one time it was meaningful, but today that's not going to make us feel safe. 
What will make us feel safe is how we deploy police. The way we deploy police right now, really um, sending them all into communities of color under the guise that there's high crime and it must be addressed. Yes, we need to have some crime prevention, but at the same time, other communities need to have some police eyes on them as well. If you send the police here, they're gonna find something. If you send the com police to other communities, there will be uh, things that the police will have to enforce if they're there, but they can't if they're not in all of those communities. And the other is dealing with the prison industrial complex. When we continue on the front end to create a scenario where police just arrest, 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 we know that we can't arrest our way out of all of the situations, but that's the scenario that we have. And so we literally clean all of the communities of our black men because they're in jail. And now we've got a situation where there's so many young children and young boys who are unsupervised and then they get into those scenarios where they are in that um, prison school to prison pipeline. So we need to address that and stop criminalizing and locking people up, particularly black and brown people for everything. In the park after dark, are you kidding me? Is that an arrestable situation? Riding your bicycle on the sidewalk, having an open container. You know, I've been riding the Long Island Railroad and everybody on the Long Island Railroad, they buy themselves a beer and sit on the train and cruise into Long Island with their beer. You can't do that in New York City. You get arrested or you get a summons. So let's look at how we enforce certain ordinances in some communities and not in others. Stop that, that could make black people safer and hold the police accountable. Hold our elected officials accountable. You know, I was looking at the mayor when the police department turned their backs on the, on the mayor of the city of New York. What message did that send to the young black or brown teenager if the police department can do that to the mayor, what chance do I stand of having um, some level of respect from the police? So there are so many things that we can do, but holding these folks accountable is a really good start. Thank you. Damon, how do we make black people feel safer? What are the next steps in law enforcement? You're on mute. Oh, that Zoom. All right. Um, first, um, Black people must start pooling their resources. We have a $1 trillion buying power, and we do not use it properly um, for development of, of, of our communities. Um, we can't be foolish and start talking, um, defunding police departments when um, we're not policing our own communities properly. We have to start doing that first um, um, be before we move on to really dealing with the police. And if we use our, pool our resources, and um, um, I'm not trying to be mean to any politician, but we gotta start buying our politicians. Our politicians have to start working for us. Um, if we can't buy them, we need to rent them. Because if we, if we look at the majority of these politicians you know, and they, they don't work for us because we don't donate to their campaign funds. Um, so when it comes to the interests of the black community, um, we need to have politicians that actually have our interests instead of coming around just on election day try, trying to get our vote. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's gonna be legislation and laws that needs to be passed. It's gonna be people um, with conscious minds that need to be appointed in these police commissioner positions or chief positions that are gonna be conscious enough that, that are able to look at policies, procedures, and training, 
and how it relates to the black community to correct it. So un until we're able to take those steps, until the black community is able to be investors in the political process, instead of just electing people and then don't go to city council meetings, don't go to, to board meetings, and don't participate in all these other meetings so they're informed, um, we're gonna be continuing to talk about it or we're gonna get laws that really don't address the situation is we're gonna get legislation that is symbolism and not substance. So the black community must get off their behind and get involved in the political process, not just voting, but pooling your resources and start running some of these young people, like the sister we got on this panel, raising money so she don't have to go to people that don't have our interests to run a campaign. We need to raise that money, run this sister for elected office, and we know that she's actually working for our interests. Yes, and, and Shanae is a good example of uh, the voice exactly. of the people. She organized this and she's been doing so much in our district, so perfect example. Um, Detective Sergeant, what are the next steps for law enforcement? How do we make the black community feel safe? I'll, I'll keep this short. I think uh, Dr. Charles touched on some very important topics. And I think Damon also with pooling resources, that's the line I was going to actually use, Dame. So thank you. <laughs> but um, in short, uh, I'll take another angle. Um, Shanae mentioned it earlier, defining what reparations look like. But we also need to find what equity looks like and what restorative, restorative practice looks like. And be unapologetic in speaking specifically to the needs of the Black community. And then holding our leaders accountable. And then on top of that, having a sustainable plan if our needs are not met. It's more to, you know, I know, I know it was mentioned before, but it's more than the protests and rallies now. We have to come with a sustainable plan if we don't see the changes that we're demanding. Thank you. All right, well, that concludes our official question and answer session and via the panel. I'm not sure if there's anyone else um, that had uh, any last comments in the audience. No, no questions uh, from the audience. Okay. But let me, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Shanae, thank you for the great moderation. Say thank you to Shanae for organizing this. Thank you to the panel. Great conversation, great talk, topics, uh, great information. So for those who are watching us, please share this. You know, social media is a powerful tool. Share it, let people hear it. Let's start the conversation and continue the conversation. And don't forget that we can uh, protest all we want, but the real change comes on November 3rd and on the primary. So your vote matters, your vote counts, and census 2020 is important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, just say uh, in closing before I pitch it to Shanae, um, there were a few nuggets that I gathered from this. Um, and the word listen, we say it a lot in the YMCA. We have a whole training called Listen First. Um, right now it's very important for leaders to listen. There were so many important statements made that I think are very simplistic. So if, if some real policy change can be made, it's really sitting at a table and filling it with um, this kind of thought leadership. Um, and then I'm gonna keep saying this, um, centering the black voice, uh, that has to continue if we're really gonna get anywhere um, in this conversation on race. We did that tonight, I think in a very powerful way. Um, we need to continue to do that and listen to those stories so that we understand that complexity um, that a lot of people are not familiar with. Um, so I'll pitch it over to Shanae. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Lucrea. Thank you, everyone, um, for tuning in. Thank you, Rue, for you know opening up your platform and just being a partner and you know asking those wonderful questions from our audience. Um, to each and every person on the panel, Dr. Um, Sophine Charles, the inside, I learned something today. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I was sitting here like shaking, nodding my head like, yes, I understand. You know, um, we all have things that we have to work on and we have to be honest with, with, with these things, you know. 
Um, so thank you for everything that you brought to the table today. Um, Detective Sergeant Charles Walker, thank you so much. Um, you know, you truly are an amazing person. You stepped in late uh, um, last minute when I needed a, someone to fill um, a, a spot. So I, tr I can't express to you my gratitude. Um, and the information that you brought to us um, specific to Yonkers is very important. And I think those are the things that you are going to hear me speak about on the council and in the community moving forward because the change has to happen locally. It has to start locally and expand. Um, so thank you for that. Sayadana, I think everyone can agree with me when we say we see a future leader of the, the biggest platform. <laughs> I mean, you are amazing. You are so elegant, so well-spoken, and so brilliant. Um, I, I have to just say this, your mama raised you well, okay? Thank you <laughs> for that. Um, and, you know, I appreciate everything that we were able to talk about today, but I know that, you know, this is a serious topic but I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I think that the audience did too. We had at, at one point, I think we had over 80 something people watching for quite a while and listening in and engaging. So I appreciate it. I certainly will be doing another one of these, not specific to law enforcement, but I think having conversations about systems um, where race is related, because in every system in America, there is race, underlying you know, racism within them. and we have to start debunking those and start really looking at that and being just raw and real. And so when I talk about raw and real, I can't forget about Dave and Jones, um, certainly raw and real. I think I need to put you in my pocketbook and take you everywhere I go because you are amazing. Um, thank you so much um, for you know just being a panelist and for everything that you've shared. Um, there is a, one question I want to ask. I don't know if this is something that you can answer, Damon, or uh, Dr. Charles, or maybe Charles Walker, but in every um, other major system, like in the healthcare system, and recently, as of like a couple years ago, in the um, prosecutorial, um, in the justice system, you see we have these commissions, we have these misconduct com um, commissions that are in place to hold professionals accountable if they do wrong, right? What is there, what is that thing called? What board or commission is that in the law enforcement world? Is there one? Anyone can answer? Is there, is there like a, a, a misconduct a, a commission for law enforcement? So if you're, you're an officer and you do something wrong, do you go before this board and they, you know, an, a, a, a a fair and impartial group of people decide the fate of that officer who, you know, is, is there something like that? It depends on what um, what city you're in. Some some cities have those type of boards in place. Um, in, in New York, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen one from the state. I haven't seen one. Um, I mean, they just, they just voted for an independent special prosecutor. So, um, which we've been talking about that for the last 20 years in, in, in New York. So um, I, have, I really haven't, I haven't seen one. Um, I know some states, they have those, those type of boards, but um, it, to New York, I haven't seen them. I haven't Thank seen them. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I think there's something to look into um, when you talk about accountability to, for our police. If they knew that there was this board in place that could hold them accountable for their actions, maybe they might start looking at things a little bit differently and start treating people, um, you know, the way that they're, they would treat their families and themselves. So um, with that, Absolutely. with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, you know, peace and love to you all. Happy Juneteenth. And thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, we conclude our broadcast for today. Thank you, everyone. Until next time.